Welcome to the Institute of Catholic Culture, a nonprofit Catholic organization dedicated to the re-evangelization of our society through educational and cultural programs offered to the public at no charge. This and other presentations, hundreds of hours of audio, are available for free on our website, www.instituteofcatholicculture.org. There you can listen to or download educational programs related to all aspects of our divine faith, and you can review our schedule of upcoming events. We hope you can join us in person. Heavenly King, Consoler, Spirit of Truth, present in all places and filling all things, the treasury of blessings and the giver of life, come dwell in us, cleanse us of all stain, and save our souls, O good one. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Our, um, our, our professor, our teacher this evening, uh, is an assistant professor of theology at Christendom College, where he teaches courses in sacred scripture, patristics, revelation, and Christology, and where he's presently chairman of the theology department. Um, Dr. Janislawski completed his doctoral thesis on the theology of biblical interpretation at the Catholic University of America this past fall. How many pages, doctor, did you get I, in on that one? I think the, the final revised was about 683. Wow. So. He, was, he was writing his doctoral thesis when I was a student at Christendom. <laughs> <laughs> amazing. Um, he earned degrees in physics and philosophy from Yale College and a master's degree in philosophical theology at Yale Divinity School in New Haven, Connecticut. He resides with his wife and three beautiful children in Paradise in Front Royal, Virginia, uh, which is all iced over at the moment. He is uh, one of the Institute of Catholic Culture's Magdala Apostolate Professors. That's, how has that experience been for you teaching for the sisters? That was, a, I mean, it's a really amazing thing. I thought the program was, was unique in terms of being able to get people that previously could not travel or had things available to them. And it was, it's a great community too. So I, I really thought that was an amazing leverage of a technology for people that uh, have a d desperate use, I think, for continuing education. But if you're active or even, you know, semi-cloistered or whatever, you're not going to go and travel to university. And it right. was, I think it was a great fit. Uh, got to know some of them quite well. And it, it's, it's a beautiful thing. And I happen to have for Dr. Janiszowski's benefit, the uh, service of orthodoxy, which was used this past Sunday. Oh, so toward yeah. the end of the class, as we go into question and answer, we might conclude with a few choice sections of that, since okay. I think it's very fitting for our topic this evening, Weeds of Heresy. You have uh, to chant it, though. That, no, I don't think we'll chant it, but we'll uh, at least I'll, I'll read off a couple of the, the, the good ones and talk. <laughs> maybe have an opportunity to talk about um, uh, all of this. And I, I'm really excited, I think, for a number of the participants in our Sophia Symposium. This is going to be a great, a great uh, blessing. And, and for everyone else also, to be able to see into the early life of the church the struggles which she faced as those weeds started to grow up in the vineyard of the Lord uh, and started to mix with the wheat and, um, and how the church dealt with this, with this difficulty, the struggle, which as Dr. Janiszowski is going to, going to explain um, really started almost right at the beginning of Christianity. These little, these little heresies which started popping up and how the church dealt with them. Uh, oftentimes not a popular way of dealing with them as far as today's society goes, um, but as we were talking about earlier and discussing, um, when the church teaches the truth, she teaches the salvific truth. And so her act of teaching the truth is always an act of love by which she explains the truth and invites people to conform their lives to the mind of Christ, because only in Christ is salvation found. So I won't go on because Dr. Janosowski wants to talk about all those things with you. So uh, welcome back, Dr. Janosowski. The, um, the mic is all yours. Thank you. Thank you very much. And it, it's a pleasure to be here again. It's, it's always a blessing to be here with ICC. And this is, of course, like an awfully large story. And one of the great things that Sabatino does to me all the time is to say, hey, could you take an hour or two and do something you normally do over the course of a semester or at least a month or two of a semester? And so we'll see. Hopefully we can go through a number of uh, different important moments of the formation of doctrine, and I started pretty early, and I think the the key thing is we're, we're going to look at how the gospel of Jesus Christ went out and then was constantly, in terms of its proclamation, defended, in terms of its theology, refined, 
And one of the nice things, if you, I found this out that when you write books, uh, it's typically the publisher that picks the cover and the cover art. And in this case, uh, with Deacon Sabatino, he gave me the title, The Weeds of Heresy in the Early Councils of the Church. So I ran with it, and uh, I thought that it was uh, first a fitting metaphor. As Deacon said, the, the parable comes uh, from our Lord's preaching in Matthew 13. It's not quite anywhere close to springtime out there right now, but soon enough there will be time uh, for people to get outdoors and to be weeding. And it's, it's a fitting metaphor. The more I dwelt on it, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a man who sowed good seed in his field, but while men were sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds amongst the wheat and went away. So when the plants came up and bore grain, the weeds appeared also. And the servants of the householder came to him and said, Sir, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then has it weeds? And he said to them, An enemy has done this. And if you're not familiar with the parable, it's a, it's a nice uh, little bit of background exegesis. We can do the next one. Uh, the word only appears here in this passage. It's uh, zizanion, and it's translated, depending on your Bible, in a few different ways, either as a weed or a cockle or a tear or as the grass called darnel. Um, but I was interested to find that it's, uh, most people are fairly confident that it's a particular kind of grass, gave you the Latin name, lolium tementulum, literally intoxicating darnel. And one of the things that's neat about the parable, if you understand the biological species, is that the weeds look like wheat through their initial stages of growth, uh, but all the while, and so that's why they're often not taken out early, you have to wait till they advance in age, it competes with the wheat and can sometimes even choke it off. Uh, when it's ripe, it's not fit for human consumption, it's typically used for animal fodder, and if you thresh it together with the good grain, with the wheat, the darnel uh, seeds are very difficult to distinguish from the wheat grains. And what that means is if you take your seed and re-sow it again, you get another generation of the same problem. Roman law actually made it a penalty to do this uh, as a uh, you know, malicious gesture to somebody else, to sow darnel amongst their wheat. Uh, moreover, if you want a sort of graphic image of uh, the good and the evil growing up side by side, uh, sometimes when the darnel is infected by a particular fungus, uh, when the grain appears, instead of being that beautiful golden amber color that we all like to sing in the amber waves of grain, when the heads of grain appear, uh, they appear black rather than uh, amber. And so I, I didn't realize what a big problem this was for farmers, but you'll see that there are sometimes some consequences to having this thing in your uh, field, in your pasture, in your garden. Uh, can be toxic to humans and sometimes fatal to animals. And so uh, I thought that was a, a choice thing that Sabatino had decided to make uh, the title for this talk of Christology, basically how the church has begun to teach and to make manifest to the first, second, third, fourth century Christians, the true doctrines of the faith, um, because they're not just things you don't expect to grow up. They're not just things that are uh, noxious in the sense of being annoying, uh, but they can be sometimes difficult to distinguish. They can choke the good grain from coming to fruition. Uh, they can be difficult to root out. That's why they wait till the end, because you don't want to tear up the good with the bad. And if they're not well separated out, uh, the problem repeats itself when you re-sow the seed that you gathered, uh, as with uh, the actual grain, so too with this problem of teaching errors about Trinity and Christology in the early church, we'll see these things tend to repeat themselves historically, and that's why it's a particularly difficult thing to uh, eliminate once and for all. But on top of that, the, the real problem is, of course, the central mysteries of our faith concern the Trinity and the Incarnation. This is why the earliest councils of the church were primarily about these topics. And as a result, uh, when we are talking about the faith that saves, having these kinds of weeds amongst that wheat uh, can be a serious problem. If we take this parable and imagine now the harvest of evangelization, uh, maybe if you're going to hear the forthcoming talk on Pentecost, you'll see that it's a harvest festival. Uh, in the first generations of the church, uh, the apostles, if the wheat is the revelation of Jesus Christ, the apostles sowed this wheat all throughout 
Europe and Asia Minor and the north part of Africa, Alexandria, ultimately all the way over to Carthage. And imagine with me for a minute the kind of joy and triumph that they would have experienced coming out of the upper room that first Pentecost and proclaiming the mystery of Jesus Christ that they had just seen with their own eyes and touched with their own hands. And uh, from synagogue to synagogue and town to town, uh, more and more people came to believe in what the apostles themselves had witnessed. Many, of course, did not believe, but we saw churches being founded all through uh, the first century and first-generation Christians turning into second-generation Christian churches and third-generation Christian churches. Uh, And that would have probably been a tremendously exhilarating, glorious time for the church. But if you flash forward not too many decades, as the decades turn into the earliest centuries, uh, we have challenges. We have grave challenges uh, that we study in church history. In the end of the first, certainly by the second, third, and fourth centuries, Weeds begin to creep in amongst the wheat. Uh, Imagine that joy of being able to announce in a pure and unalloyed and authentic fashion the revelation of Jesus Christ that would have been the Christian message now all tied up with uh, a bewildering array of messages about Jesus. Someone who perhaps had only heard a little bit about Christianity wants to find out about the Christian message and who Jesus is, uh, is faced with a variety of accounts, contradictory accounts, conflicting accounts, distorted accounts, uh, sometimes positively scurrilous accounts. And uh, imagine the sorrow and the challenge and the struggle faced by bishops of the second and third and fourth century who were trying to introduce people to Jesus in the midst of a welter of different opposing portraits. And there's a wonderful but somewhat long quote uh, by St. Basil, I thought, which was his own firsthand account of trying to teach people uh, the faith that was received from the apostles uh, in his own time of controversy. But it was a little bit long, uh, but it was a, a maudlin, glorious, but moving account of the chaos that existed uh, as the backdrop for some of the earliest councils of the church. But that's not simply a, sort of a nice moment in church history that we look back to and say, well, that worked out well. It's also a fitting description of our own day, because uh, then, as now, there's a bewildering variety of statements that are being made about Jesus. If people who are not already connected to some church or in some particular tradition go to find out uh, about the truth of the message of the Lord Jesus Christ— Uh, they too are faced with a bewildering variety of portraits. Maybe they're on the next slide. Let's see. Oh, here's some first, uh, since I don't have the deck up right in front of me, I have to guess and remember my order. Uh, Peter and Paul were already aware of this. Uh, We get some statements already in the first century of the necessity to maintain the integrity of what the gospel is. Uh, 2 Timothy 4, 1 through 5, I'll just read it here, everybody can follow along. Uh, Paul writes to Timothy, I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is judged the living and the dead, and by his appearing in his kingdom, to preach the word, to be urgent in season and out of season, to convince, rebuke, exhort, to be unfailing in patience and teaching. For the time has come when people will not endure sound teaching, But having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own likings and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander into myths. As for you, always be steady, endure suffering, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. Uh, The next quote, I believe, is from either Paul again or Peter. Here's Peter. Similar concern already now, before we get to the end of the first century, that the integrity of that revelation of Jesus Christ is preserved and handed down and defended from confusion. Peter writes, 2 Peter 3.15, So also our beloved brother Paul wrote to you according to the wisdom given to him, speaking of this as he does in all his letters. There are some things in them that are hard to understand, which the ignorant and unstable twist to their own destruction, as they do the other scriptures. 
You, therefore, beloved, knowing this beforehand, beware lest you be carried away with the error of lawless men and lose your own stability, but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To him be the glory both now and to the day of eternity. Amen. So you can see both Peter and Paul already aware of the need pastorally to stress that the proper gospel revelation of who Jesus was, what he actually said, what he did, and what the church proclaimed about him from the day of Pentecost be preserved, passed down, and as it were, weeded out of errors that were attempting to creep in. Uh, Paul sometimes gets severe about this. Paul appeals to the Corinthians. 1 Corinthians 1.10, I appeal to you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree and that there be no dissensions amongst you, but that you be united in the same mind and the same judgment. Is Christ divided? And then you probably know how he goes on. Did Paul, was Paul crucified for you? Uh, the unity of the message of the apostles was already a concern here in 60 AD. Uh, sometimes when means required it, in the next quote from Galatians, uh, Paul can be even uh, more severe. He has to chastise the Galatians in 1, 6 through 12. I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ and turning to a different gospel. Not that there is another gospel, but there are some who trouble you and want to pervert the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to that which we preach to you, let him be anathema. As we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to that which you received, let him be anathema. For I would have you know, brethren, that the gospel which was preached by me is not man's gospel. For I did not receive it from man, nor was I taught it, but it came through a revelation of Jesus Christ. And I think those quotes are insightful because you see a few things in them already. First off, the gospel, we tend to think of it as a book or as a text. In the mind of the early church, in the mind of Paul in this writing, the gospel is, is not a book. The gospel is the revelation that Christ announced in his person, by his works, by his words, and above all, by his death and resurrection from the dead. It later comes to have divinely inspired written form in what we more accurately call the gospel according to Matthew, according to Mark, according to Luke. And it's important to remember, too, that in the time that these people are writing, there is no canonical New Testament. Uh, John wouldn't even finish writing uh, his late parts of the New Testament for a decade or more after Paul wrote this. Uh, most churches by the end of the first century would not have been in possession of the canonical books of the New Testament that we have today. Probably not even into the second century did some come to have an entire collection of these things. So fundamentally, when the word of God is being proclaimed, it is at this stage being proclaimed through sacred tradition, through apostolic preaching, the passing and handing down of the message of apostolic preaching, and only later into the second century do you begin to see uh, something like a canonical set of texts being passed around that what we would call the New Testament scriptures. Um, and so you have, at the one time, the richness of sacred tradition and people passing on what they have heard from the apostles but the downside of this is also the fact that that means the gospel is primarily being passed along and promulgated through word of mouth, through preaching and through teaching. And it's also beginning to compete, and this is where the problem is, uh, with alternative accounts and with distortions and falsifications and errors. And so uh, this is the challenge that starts really right off the bat of the apostolic age. That's why I picked these quotes is that you can see Peter and Paul concerned already for the integrity of the Christian message. This is the ultimate reason for it. Christ himself wills it. Uh, in his prayer at the Last Supper, Jesus prays, John 17, 11, Holy Father, keep them, meaning the apostles, in thy name, which thou hast given me, that they may be one, even as we are one. And that's a pretty tight unity, right? The Father and the Son are one in mind, one in will, one in purpose, they're one in substance, and we'll talk about all the other ways that are one, uh, but this is uh, the closest imaginable unity, and that's the unity that Jesus wills for the believers in his church. That's part of the reason why the church has always been concerned to have unity in faith and morals amongst all Christians, because that's the expressed desire of Christ on the night in which he would die for all of their sins. 
And he even tells us the importance of this unity and what it entails. John 17, 3, Jesus says, And this is eternal life, that they may know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. Uh, So our topic here tonight in the theology of God uh, is really quite central. Uh, These are the central mysteries of the Christian faith. Uh, This is the knowledge that Christ will to impart to his disciples. Uh, It is the unity that he prayed might obtain amongst them. And it's the unity that Peter and Paul already before the close of the first century were concerned be maintained uh, as the gospel message was beginning to spread out over the entire world. Imagine when you're dealing with the church of the second, third, and fourth century no longer the only message about Jesus Christ is the one that has come down through apostolic tradition. Um, Maybe some of you know this, some of you don't. Uh, There's uh, a long process in the distribution of sacred writings. And finally, if you uh, had the opportunity to do a couple of lectures on the formation of sacred scripture, it's really only around the fourth century that you begin to see Christians everywhere having a canonical set of texts about Jesus Christ as a reference. Um, And at the same time, in the second century, and especially in the third and fourth century, a whole variety of what we call apocryphal literature begins to circulate. Religious literature of a Christian or Jewish nature, not divinely inspired. Some of it's interesting. Some of it's catechetical and still as good then as it is now, like the Didache, the Teaching of the Twelve Apostles, or the book called The Pastor of Hermas, beautiful book. Uh, Some of it is interesting historical information, but perhaps not entirely legitimate or right. Uh, Some of it are distorted accounts, exaggerated accounts, inaccurate accounts of Jesus or Paul or the apostles. Uh, Some of it is positively scurrilous literature, uh, fabrications, sometimes rewrites of the gospel expressly designed to support a certain idea that was contrary to apostolic teaching. And in this whole welter of literature that we have in the second and the third and the fourth century uh, emerges a whole variety of different statements about Jesus Christ. The pastors of the churches, the bishops, rightfully had a desire um, to defend the faithful from being deceived by these kinds of strange portraits of our Lord. And we can't get into it tonight, but if you, there's plenty of easily available Uh, documents on the internet where you can read uh, Christian Apocrypha from the second, third, and fourth century. And uh, I think some of it's, you know, almost amusing nowadays. My favorite is the Infancy Gospel of Thomas, where some idle but creative individual decided to run wild in the space of the infancy narrative. We hear very little about our Lord after his birth, flight into Egypt and coming back. we get a brief glimpse at adolescent Jesus at 12 and the finding in the temple. And then from 30 onward, we get the narrative that occupies most of the gospels. Uh, One of the texts that's circulating and called the infancy gospel of Thomas nowadays, some fellows fan fiction of what it would have been like for Mary and Joseph to have raised an omnipotent, omniscient and somewhat bratty five-year-old. And while that might, strike us as strange if we look at the portraits of Jesus in the modern environment that we occupy, uh, there's no less confusion. There's a great plurality of representations of Jesus Christ. And I just pick these kind of at random, and I don't mean to have any kind of exacting commentary uh, on each of them, but um, these are different representations of Jesus uh, that you can see hold forth to us Uh, different Christs in some of them than perhaps the one that we are familiar with. Um, And that's why this topic is particularly relevant, Uh, whether it's in the second or third or fourth century or in the 19th or 20th century, uh, there is still a need to understand the authentic nature of Jesus, who he was, what he did, and what we profess about him as Christians. Uh, The task of Christians in defending apostolic revelation uh, is to weed them out because noxious weeds damage our resources. Uh, They distract us as Christians. They say uh, things about Jesus that are oftentimes detrimental to the faith, uh, scandalize other people, mislead them, and ultimately sap the strength of the Christian message. The sort of core topic of the councils that we'll be working towards understanding uh, is Christology. 
And that's nothing other than the study of who Jesus Christ is. And if you want a simple maxim to come back to uh, repeatedly as kind of the goal that we are going to press towards and looking at these different errors in uh, what people have said about Jesus Christ is that the church has always proclaimed that Jesus Christ is fully God and fully man in one divine person, namely the second person of the Blessed Trinity, uh, came to earth, was incarnate as the man Jesus Christ, uh, without sacrificing anything of his humanity or his divinity. That's going to be our goalpost. That's the topic we're going to be coming back to in several different ways, that our end of this is to get ever clearer by looking at the errors that arose and the church response to them about Jesus Christ being fully God and fully man in one divine person. This is why it matters. Uh, the whole reason why Christology matters is that Jesus Christ cannot do what he does or say what he says without being who he is. Uh, if you think about that for a minute, there's a little scholastic maxim I put down on the bottom, action follows being. You can't do what you do without being who you are. Uh, think about this in any variety of ways. If Jesus is not who he says he is, if he's not fully God and fully man and one divine person, he cannot be our great high priest who intercedes on behalf of humanity to God the Father by offering the sacrifice of the cross. Uh, he can't be our exemplar in all things. If imitatio Christi, imitation of Christ, is the epitome of the moral life, uh, we need to have a Christ who is fully human and God's own way of showing us how to be man again after the fall. Uh, any of the doctrines that are central in Christianity, whether it's the priesthood, the sacraments, the nature of grace, uh, all of it ultimately comes back to the two foundational mysteries of the Trinity and the Incarnation, which are the distinctive claims of the Christian religion as a monotheistic faith. It is only Christians that talk about the Trinity and the Incarnation, and they are uh, not easy doctrines. They're doctrines that were sometimes confused, mislaid, uh, betrayed, falsified. But they are central because without these two central doctrines of the Trinity and of the incarnation of Christ, none of the other uh, claims of Christian theology really can get off the ground or begin to make sense. So that's why our topic uh, is central to all that we believe. This is also why it's been studied uh, all the time by any formal program in theology. It's actually remained largely, probably less changed than other areas. Uh, one of the reasons why all theology majors take this class uh, at my college, why seminarians always take classes in Christology, is because, on the one hand, these errors tend to repeat themselves. Nothing is new under the sun. Uh, those that do not study history are condemned to repeat it. Uh, some of the errors that were fought in the 2nd, 3rd, 4th century of the church uh, pop up again multiple times. I sometimes like to use the analogy of the, uh, the CDC, the Centers for Disease Control, I have this really elaborate uh, high-tech, high-security lab in Atlanta, and they have in that laboratory all these little vials of diseases that are now long dead and no longer trouble us, uh, nasty things. And you say, why do they keep them there? Because if they were ever to break out again in the wild, there would be a ready vaccine and a way to study them so that we can prevent them from doing the damage that they did. Studying the history of the church, Christology, and the early creeds and councils is very much kind of the same thing. Uh, we will find that from the second century to the 20th century, sometimes these claims about the Trinity or the incarnation of Christ uh, will be repeated. And the church has always gone back to this history as a way to refresh and strengthen and be ready to respond to it. It's also a really good mental training ground. These are difficult topics, uh, but there's a nice consolation in the fact that throughout history, pretty much every way that you could get it wrong has been done. Uh, some people know that statement about, I think someone asking Michelangelo, how did he carve this beautiful statue like David? He said, I simply got rid of everything that wasn't David. If it wasn't David, I chipped it away. So too, when we look at the history of these early heresies, uh, it gets our own thought sharper on understanding well the mystery of Jesus Christ, because we see the ways it's gone wrong, either big errors, obvious ones, or more subtle ones, and by ruling out what's wrong, we zero in on what's right and how to understand it correctly. And of course, this has central expression. Every Sunday, all of us say the creed. And why is that such a prominent feature of our liturgy? Because this was the theological accomplishment uh, of several centuries of struggle within the church. And so uh, with that kind of introduction, I wanted to go into 
why, uh, what we're going to look at tonight for early errors and how this helps to shape our thought. I want to talk about some of the very early heresies and the church's response to them. Uh, we'll talk about the Ebionites and the Nazarenes. I don't know if anyone's heard of those folks much before. Docetism, modalism, and adoptionism. If we're lucky, we might get to Arianism, but we'll see how it goes. All right, so let's take a look at the first error uh, that we find. Uh, some of these things, I think, are insightful, too, when we look at uh, what is feeding some of these uh, weeds of the early church. A lot of times in these heresies, there are dynamics, I think, that are very insightful to pay attention to. Uh, Heresy, most people think of as somebody, you know, fervently insisting that something is correct when the church has condemned it. And that's not in any way a bad way to think of it. Certainly the hallmark of heresy is that you have to teach something that has been formally condemned and persist in that even after you've been censured. But heresy is not simply about having a wrong idea, uh, about saying something is true when it's false. The real I think, issue with heresy is that it's a failure to affirm enough. Uh, A lot of times, uh, I think the Lubach has a saying, uh, every good bit of theology begins in paradox. More difficult concepts take sometimes a little while to master, whether it's in the natural sciences or whether it's in arts or literature. And a lot of times what we see in these heresies is a failure to affirm the complete mystery that scripture and the apostolic preaching gives to us about Jesus Christ. Uh, Its problem is not so much in what it affirms as to what it's not going further and also affirming and synthesizing into one complete and correct portrait. Uh, I already mentioned part of the background, what makes the soil so full of weeds, is that there's no real promulgation of scripture in the first century to all the churches, and there's still a lot of debate about what constitutes the canon of sacred scripture in the second and third century. Another big challenge for the church to work out is the relationship between the Old and the New Testament and how Christ is the linchpin that unites them in his one person. And lastly, then as now, uh, the early church, like we today, face the influence of various worldviews and philosophies that are antagonistic to Christian revelation, and sometimes that has a profound distorting effect uh, on how people think about religion and the gospel. First group, very early, first century, the Ebionites are an early uh, schismatic group. They existed predominantly only in the first and second centuries AD. Um, And for many of the heresies in this period, our information about them is scarce. We predominantly know about the Ebionites from St. Irenaeus of Lyon, second century bishop in France. He wrote a nice book called Against the Heresies, about 170. He tells us about them. And Tertullian and Origen in the 2nd and 3rd centuries also tell us a little bit about the Ebionites. Uh, As with a lot of these early heresies, we don't have any surviving record from the other side. We don't have any Ebionite texts or self-descriptions, so we only get an account from them from those that were vigorously taking up apologetics against them. Uh, They seem to be primarily, though, a breakaway set of Judaizers, uh, Jews who had heard the gospel and for one reason or another had difficulty with what we see in Acts 15, that the kingdom of God, the church, should include Gentiles and indeed include them by virtue of their faith and baptism and not require them to follow the law of Moses. Uh, that's an interesting and fun moment in gospel church history in and of itself. But if you're familiar with the Council of Jerusalem, this is the central question. When Jesus says to go out and preach the gospel to all nations and to baptize them, When Paul and Barnabas start to do that without requiring the Gentiles to be circumcised, to keep kosher, to keep the law of Moses, there's great controversy. And already some groups within the church are beginning to resist that, the so-called Judaizers or Pharisee Christians. And it seems that maybe after the council, uh, some of these groups formed Jewish Christian enclaves unto themselves, did not keep Eucharist or table fellowship with other groups that were mixed or Gentile, uh, and eventually seem to have broken away from the main line of the church and slipped into uh, more profound errors about not just baptism and justification, but even about Christ himself. Uh, They seem to have been largely uh, vanished off the scene by the third century AD. We don't hear very much more about them after that. What did they believe uh, when it comes to the doctrine of Jesus Christ? If you want a concrete example of how these errors tend to recur, uh, while I haven't seen historical record of them since the third century, 
Uh, I did do a little hunting online, and lo and behold, here's an EB Knight church that's been running, I think, in San Francisco since about 1980. Uh, so it's a, it's a repro. I don't think there's any living connection at all, but if you want to see what goes on in today's day and age, we have to remember we're in a very much post-confessional age, right? It used to be that even if you were, uh, not Catholic, you were Christian of some denomination and that denomination had a doctrine that typically included, uh, you know, some basic statements about the fundamental mysteries of the faith, Trinity, incarnation, church, sacrament. Nowadays, uh, we're in an interesting position where a lot of people that call themselves Bible-believing Christians are pretty much picking up the Christian scriptures and making sense of them as best they can on their own. And a lot of times, you will find reprises for that reason of some of these earliest Christian errors. Um, They denied the divinity of Christ, and any attempts to maintain that he somehow preexisted his conception and birth. So even if we think of him as a spiritual creature— and not as God from God, uh, that Jesus had no divinity, no spiritual preexistence. They also rejected the notion of Jesus' atoning death and physical resurrection. So the passion, understood as a ransom for our sins, or as a sacrifice on behalf of all humanity, has no place in their Christology. Uh, They believe that Jesus is fully human in the exact same way that you and I are. Um, Origen recounts that there was a little division amongst them. Some of them had one opinion and some another on the virgin birth. Uh, Those that thought that our Lord was conceived virginally without the uh, physical means of St. Joseph broke off and called themselves Nazarenes, where it seems the main line of Ebionites uh, rejected the doctrine of the virgin birth also and held that Jesus was merely the human son of Joseph. And I think that's interesting. We see a number of patterns in even the earliest heresies. Uh, we see a breakaway from the main line of the church after the Council of Jerusalem, and then we see subdivision within the schism. Uh, and that's a pattern you can probably identify pretty readily in a Christian you know, denomination somewhere close to you. Uh, that's the sad fate of the gospel message after the Reformation is that we have uh, almost limitless subdivision of sects that are all claiming slightly different, sometimes radically different messages about Jesus Christ. Uh, So the Ebionite Christology seems to be Jesus is simply a man and that his passion is not some sort of supernatural act whereby the divine son of God makes himself a ransom for our sins, but Jesus is fully and completely human, perhaps not even conceived of the Holy Spirit, but merely by St. Joseph. So if that's all what Jesus is not compared to the Orthodox portrait, what is he? Uh, Why are they interested in him? Why is he a central figure? Uh, in their belief system. Irenaeus tells us that for their Christian scriptures, uh, well, I shouldn't say the plural, they kept no New Testament texts except a modified copy of Matthew's gospel, uh, from which the infancy narrative and passion accounts had been removed, because you can't really read the infancy narrative without a very clear picture uh, that Jesus is coming uh, as the divine son of God. And the passion account, for reason we just mentioned, They did not understand the passion in the manner of a ransom for the salvation of the sins of the world. Uh, Eusebius has a little speculation that they might have used a different text called the Gospel to the Hebrews as their Christian scripture, but they may end up being the same thing. The Ebionites disliked Paul. Uh, They regarded Paul as a great apostate, uh, and they rejected eventually the the, uh, inclusion of Gentiles in the church from the time of the Council of Jerusalem. So some people speculate that they were the Pharisee Christians uh, who broke from the church after 50 AD. This is what they regarded Jesus of Nazareth as. First and foremost, a great prophet, enlightened by God. And not to uh, give a message that was relevant to this one particular time, place, or crisis in Judaism, but primarily as an outstanding, enlightened, spiritual expositor of the law of Moses. He was the promised successor to Moses in their view. And if you don't know what that's all about, the text at the bottom of the slide, Deuteronomy 18, starting in verse 15, when Moses knows that he is going to die before he leads the people into the promised land, there's a long farewell address. And Moses promises that God will in the future raise up someone to be successor to him. Uh, Here's the text. The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from amongst you, from your brethren. Him you shall heed. Just as you desired of the Lord your God at Horeb on the day of the assembly when you said, 
let me not hear again the voice of the Lord my God or see this great fire any more lest I die. Moses is referring back to when the Jews were gathered around the base of Mount Sinai and God came down and wreathed the mountain in fire and smoke, how they were terrified to be in the presence of God. So they wanted Moses to be their lawgiver and their representative and their shepherd. So too, Moses says, there will arise after me someone from amongst you who will be a leader of comparable magnitude. And this is whom they thought Jesus was. That he was a enlightened expositor of the law of Moses who grasped its spiritual principles more profoundly than any other rabbi or person had done at the time, and that by this excellence, he was to be this promised successor. Uh, you get that nicely in Matthew's gospel. It's familiar to us, but arresting to a Jewish reader in the transfiguration. Jesus is standing between Moses and Elijah. Uh, if there's anybody you listen to in Judaism, it's Moses, and shortly after him, Elijah. And the voice from heaven says, this is my beloved son, him shall you heed. Not them or listen to Moses and Elijah and also my beloved son, uh, but to heed Jesus in the midst of the three of them. So this is how the Ebionites saw Christ. And I don't think that's terribly unfamiliar even to the 20th century. If you take a look uh, at the works of groups like uh, the Jesus Seminar, the quest for the historical Jesus. I Textbooks that I had when I was in Catholic school in the 70s uh, tended to produce pretty frequently this image of Jesus as a loving, caring, sharing, enlightened, spiritual expositor of the meaning of the Bible, but certainly not very supernatural, uh, not as great of a focus on his death for the sake of the sins of the world, and uh, you can read books like uh, The Lapse Priest, John Dominic Crossan's Historical Jesus, The Life of a Mediterranean Jewish Peasant, and the theology is fundamentally Ebionite, uh, even to this day. And one of the things that we see there is, you know, their choice of mini Bible, just Matthew, modified Matthew, goes right hand in hand with their beliefs about Jesus. Scripture and Christology have always gone hand in hand from the first, second, third to the fourth century of the church. They're working simultaneously on defending the integrity of the divinely inspired text and also the fundamental mysteries about Christ. They choose their text to fit their Christology rather than what we would do, which is to look at what's divinely inspired literature and make sure that our Christology accounts for all of it. We see the pattern, as I mentioned, that ecumenical councils are often followed by a schism. We tend to think that once a council gets all of the momentum necessary to actually have this huge thing in the church, that that's the end of the problem. They had a council, they taught, they fixed it. No, uh, very typically not. The controversy doesn't end, but at least the dividing line is clear. And from the very first instances that we have, like these first century Ebionites, we see that pattern. And those that break off tend to subdivide, and in the Ebionite error, uh, the failure to affirm the full truth. The humanity of Jesus, 100% affirmed, but at the 100% expense of affirming his divinity. It's an easy first error to start with. It's very lopsided, all human and no way divine. Uh, but maybe you can see some of the basic patterns uh, that I'll keep, to, keep on observing as we go through here. The pendulum tends to swing sometimes from one extreme to the other. Part of the difficulty with the novelty of the revelation of Jesus Christ is how do you synthesize it all? And uh, we have this one word that we all use unreflectively, familiarly, habitually as Catholics. We say the Old Testament is fulfilled in the new. And that was not easy to arrive at. That was not automatic. That was a process of several centuries of the church synthesizing the mystery of what had been revealed in Jesus. We don't say the new replaces the old. We don't say the new updates the old. We don't say the new corrects the old, surpasses the old. We say fulfilled. But for the Ebionites, you can see uh, that this is not the relationship between the Testaments, and it's also reflected in the fact that they have a rather different view of Jesus. Uh, for the Ebionites, Christianity is basically Judaism 1.1. Uh, it's not even a 2.0. Uh, it is simply a significant but small update to what had already been given from Moses through the last of the canonical prophets. Um, and we also see that they have kind of a canon in the canon. Uh, it's only their whittled down copy of Matthew that is their lens whereby they view the Christian mystery and they selectively reject the other witnesses of the apostles, Mark, Luke, John, especially Paul, 
uh, in coming to their limited portrait of Jesus Christ. Uh, you can see the exact opposite error breaking out at the same time. I forget who originated this quip, but uh, one of the ways you can see the orthodoxy of the church is that you have people making opposing claims on both sides throughout the ages. Uh, while the Ebionites are going for a very human Jesus in no way divine, we have the exact opposite by the end of the first, early second century. Uh, so the second error I wanted to talk about is called docetism. Docetism is a funny word, but it comes from the Greek dokein, meaning to seem or to appear, or doxa is an appearance in Greek. And the fundamental teaching of the docetists was that Jesus only appeared to have a bodily nature. He was not made of matter. In reality, he was completely spiritual, uh, but people saw him, right? He walked and talked and moved around and did things, and they would say that it was simply an appearance, uh, that just as an angel in the Old Testament would temporarily take on a visible form in order to interact with men, so too when the divine Son of God came down from heaven, he merely appeared to have a human body. He merely appeared to suffer, but was in no way actually physical. Now, again, this might strike you as like completely weird, um, because we don't see that really running around today. Our age is much more suited to the purely human Jesus. Uh, but the opposite extreme was also out there in the earliest church. Uh, and some people were so into uh, mind and spiritual things that they did so to the detriment, indeed the rejection of physical things. Maybe some of you know, and maybe we can catch it in questions. There's this perennial challenge in philosophy to overcome dualism and opposition between what is immaterial and material, between what is spiritual and what is physical. And one of the backgrounds of this era of docetism is that people were oftentimes, because they were committed to certain philosophical views, tending to oppose what is physical and what is spiritual. And when you take the gospel and mix it into that, you sometimes get a very strange view about Jesus. Uh, Marcion had some rather odd ideas, but again, I think you'll find that there are ideas you will still see echoed today. We don't know exactly when he was born and died, uh, but he taught as a docetist um, the following things, that the creator God of the material world was a deity, and he understands us in the pagan sense of some kind of immortal, powerful, spiritual being. And uh, this is the God of the Old Testament. There is another deity, a higher deity, that is the God of the spiritual world and its order, and created it, a God entirely of mind and spirit. And this deity is the father of Jesus Christ. So we're coming clearly not from the background of Judaism anymore, but from paganism. The notion of multiple deities is fine. Uh, the notion of the opposition amongst deities is fine. And in Marcion's weird distortion of the gospel, um, we have a lower God, creator of matter, and a higher God, creator of spirit. And it's the Jewish Old Testament that worships the God that created the material world. And Jesus in the New Testament comes as a representative of the higher and more spiritual being in order to free mankind from its bondage to matter. Um, as a result, Jesus appears in human form to enlighten men, to speak to them about spiritual things, and to rescue them from being subject to the flesh, and fleshment being understood as an evil thing. Jesus, therefore, would have no incarnation, because why would a God concerned with light and truth and spirit and matter want to take uh, a body that it was his job to liberate people from? The genius of Christianity and the New Testament from Marcion was how the New Testament triumphs over the old. Sometimes we call this supersessionism. The New Testament overturns the old, makes the old disposable, irrelevant, overcome. Uh, the New Testament person can look at the history of revelation about God and see as an enlightened individual that the whole progress towards the coming of Jesus was dialectical. No more do we have to do what was done in the Old Testament. Now we have the new. The Ebionites reviled Paul because he wanted Gentile inclusion. For Marcion, Paul is the hero because he sees Paul as helping to eliminate Jewish legalism from the observance of Christianity. 
both sides there, you can see air and opposite extremes about how the old and the new are united in Christ and how the church and the synagogue are related to one another. Just like the Ebionites used uh, a modified copy of scriptures, Marcion only received Luke's gospel, from which, conveniently, Old Testament references and other unhappy passages had been eliminated. Marcion liked to oppose the God of the Old Testament and the New Testament. I have some quotes. I think they're kind of fun. Uh, He said that the God of the Old Testament sends she-bears to devour children for Elisha's merriment, but Jesus says, let the little children come to me. The God of the Old Testament banished lepers, but Jesus cleansed and embraced the lepers. The God of the Old Testament is angry and vengeful. He only loves the Jews. The God of the New Testament is merciful and kind and loves everyone, whether Jew or Greek. Uh, Some of this probably still sounds very familiar to you. Uh, there's still a tendency, I think, to popular Marcionism. Uh, I don't know how many times I've heard people say, the God of the Old Testament, kind of as a thing, as a phrase, as if this represented something in any way different from the same one God of the New Testament. The uh, wave of stripping the Jewish roots out of Christianity that we saw in the 19th and 20th century Germany is a kind of neo-Marcionism. Uh, There is a perennial neglect, I think, from time to time and place to place of what Paul tells us about in Romans, which is that the Gentiles are grafted into the beautiful cultivated olive vine that is Israel and that the church springs forth from Israel. And uh, Marcion would not see it that way. He would see the brilliance of the church as snatching up what was good in older revelation, but showing how it had been overturned, superseded, and made irrelevant by the new. And perhaps most importantly and centrally, if Jesus has come as a representative of the spiritual order triumphing over the material, not only did he not have a body, he certainly did not suffer, he certainly did not die. Divine beings don't do that. That's kind of the nice thing about being divine. Nobody beats you up. Uh, You don't have to worry about mortality. You're not going to be harmed. And so, again, thinking about partial affirmations of the one mystery Marcion, in a more pagan way, fully latches on to the divinity of Jesus Christ, and he does so at the complete exclusion of the humanity. It is merely an appearance. Now, these early errors are simplistic, right? It's all one way and not the other, and I gave you two opposed extremes. But uh, as we go a little bit further into the 3rd and 4th century, uh, we'll see that the errors become more sophisticated and the errors are more subtle, and they take a little bit more attention to begin to root out and to identify uh, where the church teaching really helps to push us forward into a more accurate and complete picture of Jesus Christ. We'll see this pattern. Uh, Very few heresies in the early church can be accused of being unbiblical. This is why Deacon Sabatino was always encouraging people to open their Bibles and know them and read them. Uh, None of these lack texts in support of their position. So I gave you a few favorites. Uh, Flesh and blood shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Right out of 1 Corinthians 15, Paul tells you, right? Says Marcion, what I'm preaching. As was the man of dust, so are those who are of the dust. Old Testament people are carnal and about physicality. And as is the man of heaven, so are those who are of heaven. Just as we have borne the image of the man of dust, we shall also bear the image of the man of heaven. Flesh and blood shall not inherit the kingdom of heaven. For Marcion, the process of becoming enlightened was about realizing that our human condition, which has a foot in both camps, matter and spirit, is all about leaving our attachment to things that are carnal and pursuing things that are purely spiritual. And if you go, but doesn't Paul teach about the resurrection of the body in the very same chapter? That's all right. Marcion's got one for you. He'll say, keep in mind that that's a spiritual body. It's a body that's not bodily, says Marcion. Uh, In his view, the whole process of salvation involves transcending the flesh and becoming pure spirit. And likewise, Philippians, uh, you have to twist this, as Peter warned us about in the beginning of this lecture. Paul says, Jesus emptied himself, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself. So if I walked up to somebody, uh, she would not be pleased if I said to Monica, you uh, look like you're in human form today. (laughs) Uh, Thank you. 
You say, uh, this person looks to be in the likeness of a man. That seems to imply that they are not, in fact, a man. They seem to be in human form. Maybe they're some alien visitor, maybe they're a hologram, but when we speak that way, it doesn't seem like they're actually human. Uh, so there are texts that Marcion would bring in to support his position. There are a bevy of texts you can bring in to refute his position. But we're going a little bit over time, so why don't I stop there and we'll take questions on these first two elementary sets of oppositions and then we can go on further. Thank you, Dr. Dr. Janislavski. It's uh, very interesting. There's a, a couple questions coming in, Doctor, on, um, on the connection between these early heresies and Islam. Um, and uh, there, the, the people are seeing the possible connection between the Ebionite heresy and some, some of the beliefs of Islam. Do you have anything to say about that? It's, uh, it's interesting. Of course, we're way, be, we're way before Islam at this point, right? Because we're, we're dealing with first, second, third century. Um, I don't think I would have sufficient competence as an historian of Islam to to. I wouldn't want to sort of venture to comment and be inaccurate. Uh, hopefully a good professional scruple. Though I have heard of people that are interested in this area of what did Islam pick up from the Judaism of its day, from the Christianity of its day, and whether that was, uh, and from, you know, breakaway sects that were, you know, Christian factions or schisms or denominations. It, what in particular, I, I do not know. I don't think I'd be able to, to accurately tell you. And part of that's not just, looking at the Quran, but looking at the influences in Muhammad's life and what thought forms we could identify him having access to, contact with, where would he have learned it from? Can we say for sure it's this or that that's influencing his thought or writing? So I, I, sadly to say, I, I don't think I'd be able to accurate that, uh, answer that responsibly. There is, uh, we do have a couple recordings on the history and development of theology in Islam by Dr. Marshner. Uh, you might want to take a look at that for those interested uh, remember, as, as Dr. Janisowski was mentioning, that um, I Islam doesn't really come on the scene until, until the early, mid-7th century, um, so much later than this. And the heresies which uh, Muhammad appears to have been uh, receiving out there in the desert are those that are pushed out of Christendom, obviously uh, with Constantine the Great and the conversion of the empire, then uh, the heretics are are pushed out. Well, not always pushed out, but for the most part, end up outside of the borders of the empire. And the theory is that they end up out there uh, influencing people like Muhammad, who are bringing together uh, old pagan ideas uh, as well as some some heretical Christian ideas. So uh, it's possible some of the, even these some of these early heresies as they morph later in in Christianity and in. Uh, heretical sex then end up out there. So you could see maybe some strains there or something like that. Uh, for those that are still participating, we'll close with a little prayer from, uh, as I was mentioning, Dr. Janisowski was asking about um, the practice of the Eastern churches. Many of you know I'm Byzantine. And um, the first Sunday of Lent uh, among the Eastern churches, uh, among the Byzantine churches, is called the service, the, the, uh, the Sunday of Orthodoxy. Orthodoxy obviously means true teaching. Um, and, uh, and so the service of the triumph of orthodoxy uh, originated as the, the restoration of images or icons in the church after one of the particular heresies which tried to rid the church of icons and uh, burning and slashing them, throwing them out. Um, as we've said before, there's nothing new under the sun, is there, doctor? So these things go back uh, uh, very far. And so on this first Sunday of Lent, um, the, uh, the commemoration of the restoration of orthodoxy in the face of heresy uh, of the early church and the preservation of the true teaching of the church is always commemorated among all of the Eastern churches. And a way of commemorating is remembering the church's restoration or proclamation of truth and rejection of error. Um, and so the, I'll just share with you the first section of the, uh, the text and one of the first anathemas, which is, which is remembered. Uh, the creed is stated by the whole community, uh, and then uh, the deacon proclaims, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Mm -hmm. This is the faith of the apostles. This is the faith of the fathers. This is the orthodox faith. This faith has established the universe. Furthermore, we accept and confirm the counsels of the holy fathers and their traditions and writings which are agreeable to divine revelation. 
And though the enemies of orthodoxy oppose this providence and the saving revelation of the Lord, yet the Lord has considered the reproaches of his servants, for he mocks those who blaspheme his glory and has challenged the enemies of orthodoxy and put them to flight. As we therefore bless and praise those who have obeyed the divine revelation and have fought for it, so we reject and anathematize those who oppose this truth. If while waiting for their return and repentance, they refuse to turn again to the Lord. And in this we follow the sacred tradition of the ancient, the ancient church, holding fast to her traditions. To those who deny the existence of God and assert that the world is self-existing, and that all things in it occur by chance, and not by the providence of God, anathema. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thank you all for participating this evening. God bless you, and uh, see you next week. We hope you enjoyed this presentation from the Institute of Catholic Culture. If you'd like to learn more about the mission of the Institute, and how you may become a part of this important work, please visit our website at www.instituteofcatholicculture.org or call us at 540-635-7155. And may the glory of Christ Church be ever more manifest upon the earth. St. John the Evangelist, pray for us.